Welcome to the Purion Institute. I'm Dottie Laflamme. I'm here to introduce today's webinar on creating collaborative care through nutrition conversations. Despite some competition from the internet and social media, 83% of pet owners trust their veterinarians for nutritional advice, which is important. Most veterinarians today are aware of the importance of good nutrition, both for healthy pets and those that require therapeutic diets. Despite this though, only 22% of veterinarians proactively initiate a nutrition conversation during consultations. There are many reasons for this, including a hectic schedule, a lack of confidence about nutrition, and others. Our goals today are to share with you some extremely useful information and tips that will help you have those important conversations with your clients about pet nutrition. Nutrition conversations are about collaborating directly with your clients, but there's a framework to these conversations that you're going to hear about during this webinar. They will help you in your practice. Each nutrition conversation should include an assessment, a recommendation, plans for follow-up, and the outcomes should be recorded. Now, nutritional assessments are adaptive and they're dynamic, meaning a quick reassessment at each and every visit helps the veterinary healthcare team provide proactive, partnered healthcare. Now, as you are aware, some nutrition conversations can be more sensitive, maybe difficult, or more emotional than others. In this webinar, you will learn about key communication skills that are useful for addressing potentially difficult conversations. But before I introduce our speakers for today, I would like to also introduce you to a fantastic new resource from the Purina Institute that will help you and all of your staff have those productive conversations with your clients while also building your confidence and knowledge about nutrition. That new resource is Center Square, available on the Purina Institute website. Whether you have one minute and need quick answers or 30 minutes for more in-depth learning, you will find valuable information at Center Square. Let me share with you this brief introductory video about the Center Square. As you're discussing nutrition with your clients, you're asked many different questions every day. When it comes to nutrition questions, you want to provide credible answers backed by science. Introducing Center Square from the Purina Institute. Created for veterinary professionals, Center Square is an easily accessible toolkit of resources that facilitates client friendly nutrition conversations you'll find the most up-to-date science on nutrition all in one place. Convenient tools and concise key messages that are easy to convey to clients. You can also search within a broad range of nutrition topics. Center Square makes it easy to share resources with your clients. You can download, print, or email for nutrition conversations backed by science. So whether you have five minutes or 30 minutes, you will find knowledgeable, practical pet nutrition advice on Center Square from the Purina Institute. Together, we can shape the nutrition conversation and help pets live their best life. As you have just seen, at Center Square, you can find quick answers to nutrition questions, or more in-depth information about your nutrition questions, plus useful tools and tips for everyday practice. The veterinary healthcare teams that tested this in beta testing agreed that this easy to use site provides practical nutrition information in a way that is easy to understand and easy to relate to pet owners. The site contains credible scientific information that can be downloaded and shared with staff and pet owners. Perhaps most important to some, many of the veterinary professionals using the site indicated it saved them time. 
So as you take your learnings from today's webinar back and put it into practice in your clinic, I think you will also want to explore the benefits of using the Center Square website. With that, let's get to the webinar. I have the great pleasure to introduce two phenomenal veterinary nutritionists that have dedicated their careers not only to the promotion of nutrition, but to helping veterinarians learn to communicate with their clients about nutrition. Dr. Sarah Aboud, she received her veterinary degree from Michigan State University, completed an internship in large animal medicine at the University of Minnesota, and then completed a nutrition residency and a PhD in nutrition at The Ohio State University. She worked in the R&D department at Ralston Purina for five years before returning to academia. Among her other roles, she served as Assistant Dean of Student Programs at Michigan State University's College of Veterinary Medicine for seven years, where she also taught small animal nutrition, communication skills, animal welfare, and veterinary leadership. Since 2020, Dr. Aboud has been an independent consultant as she continues to provide veterinary nutrition consultations and also offers nutritional coaching for veterinary healthcare teams. She is an active member of the American Academy of Veterinary Nutrition, enjoys teaching and speaking, as well as writing with her colleagues, and she has co-authored several dozen scientific articles and book chapters. With her is Dr. Julie Churchill. Julie completed her veterinary degree and then a combined residency and a PhD program in small animal internal medicine and clinical nutrition at the University of Minnesota. Subsequently, she developed the first financially self-sustaining nutrition service in an academic institution at the University of Minnesota's Veterinary Medical Center. Dr. Churchill is a diplomate of the American College of Veterinary Nutrition and a member of the American Academy of Veterinary Nutrition. Currently, she serves as Professor of Clinical Nutrition at the University of Minnesota's College of Veterinary Medicine, where she teaches small animal nutrition courses throughout all four years of the veterinary curriculum. Dr. Churchill is passionate about all aspects of small animal clinical nutrition. She's also interested in teaching and improving client communication to successfully integrate nutrition into every patient's care. She served on the task force to develop the AHA guidelines for weight management, and she serves on the executive board of the Pet Nutrition Alliance and the Educational Tools Committee of the Pet Nutrition Alliance, working to develop a go-to website for credible nutrition information. Dr. Churchill also serves on the board of the Association of Pet Obesity Prevention and is a co-author and advocate for Global Pet Obesity Initiative, which has been endorsed by 23 veterinary professional organizations. Doctors Churchill and Aboud will now join forces to present Creating Collaborative Care Through Nutrition Conversations. During the presentation, feel free to submit your questions using the Q&A section on the right side of your screen, and we'll address these at the completion of the webinar. On behalf of Julie and myself, we want to begin with how delighted we both were to be invited by the Purina Institute to share our experiences and tips for creating collaborative care through nutrition conversations. We strongly believe that communication skills can be learned, and through daily practice, we can each improve. We also believe that members of every veterinary healthcare team can be trained to nurture the human-animal bond between clients and pets, as well as be empowered to deliver nutrition recommendations for every pet at every hospital visit. Whether you had communication training in vet school or learned it in the trenches, I quickly discovered that nutrition is the area where effective communication is so important. We take a growth mindset approach meaning we're not a finished product, it's a lifelong journey. And so we can always continue to improve. I continually see that client that I learn a new skill. If you don't have confident communication skills, nutrition will remain a challenge. Communication skills intersect with nutrition in every patient, client, doctor visit. We may know exactly what or how to feed an animal, but if we don't listen to the owner, and we don't use clear language to connect and educate, then our wisdom will be unheard or it gets lost. 
Since I did not take any communication courses when I was in school, I've regularly been in pursuit of good resources that I can read or watch to practice and improve my skill set. When possible during our presentation, we'll point out some helpful resources that are available now at the Center Square website. We refer to this as enhancing your nutrition talking toolkit. Um, as an overview, what we want to do is help you develop your framework for each nutrition conversation through doing performing a nutrition assessment where there might be risks for malnutrition, following up with a specific recommendation and a follow-up plan on how to evaluate and stay connected to our clients. Key communication skills to address difficult nutrition conversations are to listen and identify client expectations. We really want to align our expectations to theirs in order to have success. We want to use these communication skills to address nutrition-related examples throughout this session. But what I really want to also emphasize is that these are transferable skills. These communication tools can just as easily apply to when you're trying to convince or persuade a client to pursue a diagnostic plan or, an other, or a different therapeutic plan. In this slide, we're showing a simple scale from 1 to 10 where the low number, one, represents a typical healthcare team who doesn't really place much value on holding nutrition conversations. This could be due to a lack of experience or knowledge, a lack of time, a lack of confidence, or some other factor on the part of the veterinarians or the technicians. The middle number, five, represents those situations when some members of the healthcare team do talk about nutrition, but they don't always find it easy or straightforward. This could be due to a lack of support from management, a lack of adherence on the part of clients, a lack of some personal confidence, or maybe feeling like they just don't have very much experience in practice. The number 10, the highest number on the scale, reflects the healthcare team that does recognize the value of holding nutrition conversations. There's a critical mass in the team that gets the value and they actively perform nutritional assessments and make specific diet recommendations for every patient at every visit. So basically this 1 to 10 scale is an assessment tool and we hope you'll all agree that an important professional skill we use every day is that of assessment. We assess our patients, our staffing needs, our inventory, our practice management goals, etc. So we'd like to ask each of you to self-assess your own practice on the spectrum of nutrition readiness. Think about your own situation for a moment and write down the number between 1 and 10. We feel it's so important to help a practice achieve nutrition readiness because recent studies have shown that pet owners want to talk to their healthcare team about pet food and a nutritional plan from their family practice. They want a recommendation on what's the best food, the best brand, and how much should they be feeding. But we know that veterinary healthcare teams may not be delivering these services, or at least in a way that the client can truly hear it. And some even avoid talking about nutrition. And this is really a missed opportunity. We believe it's important that clinics and practices determine the key areas where their healthcare team can take back the nutrition conversation, uh, what we would call low hanging fruit. And the way to do this is by first assessing each team member's passion, motivation, and skill set for bringing up and talking about nutrition topics. We want to emphasize this discussion is focusing on conversation with clients or communication as a way to create collaborative care. Great communication is a critical skill in successfully integrating nutritional care, and we're using nutrition as a model for these skills. You'll be successful when your confidence matches your knowledge base. If you need to review nutrition topics or build your confidence in that nutrition knowledge base, check out Center Square from the Purina Institute. There you can find simple to read and understandable information on almost any pet nutrition topic and more in-depth information when you need it. For those who are leaders in your veterinary healthcare team, you could encourage one or more of your team members to develop their professional expertise in various nutrition topics so that they can be the go-to person in the practice. There are several examples or areas in daily practice where nutrition conversations should be taking place. 
We think there's three of the easier categories for what Sarah referred to as the low-hanging fruit for the veterinary healthcare teams to focus attention on. Puppy and kitten exams, myth busting when and where clients specifically ask those nutrition related questions for information that maybe isn't exactly accurate, and weight prevention and weight management. And there's one additional area that many DVMs and technicians might consider straightforward or easy, um, that's therapeutic nutrition, because there are specific products marketed for specific medical conditions. However, we will talk about where and when we see challenges and why we would suggest not starting with this particular nutrition category. So where do nutritionists start in this whole process? Well, nutritionists begin by doing a nutritional assessment. And the purpose of doing the nutritional assessment is to decide if the patient is at low risk, moderate risk, or high risk for potential malnutrition, either a nutritional deficiency or a nutrient excess. Generally speaking, low risk situations tend not to require additional diagnostics and might require only periodic monitoring, for example, at six or nine or a 12 month interval. The moderate risk situations tend to require some diagnostics and often the monitoring is a bit more frequent, say at four or six month intervals. And then the high risk situations often require an in-depth nutritional assessment with one or more diagnostics and close-up monitoring, sometimes weekly or at monthly intervals. The great thing about this nutrition screening tool is that we're leveraging tasks that we already do in our exam rooms. We're not asking you to do one more thing to your already busy day, but nutritional screening is taking place during your history and physical exam. Most veterinarians and technicians are doing some form of nutritional screening without documenting it. And we wanna really encourage a more mindful approach, a more prevent preventive oriented approach to finding areas of concern related to food and nutrition. So during the history taking, we learn from the pet owner enough information to determine whether they're feeding a conventional or an unconventional diet, or whether it's balanced and appropriate uh, containing vitamins and minerals and meeting all of their nutrient needs. We also determine if treats or snacks are exceeding 10%. When this happens, they are at risk for an imbalanced intake. During the physical exam, we need to assign and record not just body weight, but a body condition score and a muscle condition score. So these pieces of information can be considered in conjunction with the current documented body weight hair coat, skin quality, and the presence or absence of dental disease, or any new medical condition. So really it's all those things you're already doing on your physical exam findings. If you check off more, three or more of these criteria, that's a clear indication that you wanna conduct a little more in-depth evaluation of your patient. This means that when there are more than one or two risk factors identified, nutrition could really have an impact in improving pet health. For example, the simplest diet history for an otherwise healthy patient should be documented in the medical record as the specific product name of the food that's being fed, a specific volume in cups or cans or grams, the frequency of the meals and treats each day, and a monitoring plan. The easiest would be a monthly body condition score that's done at home. When fewer than three risk factors do get checked on your nutritional screening checklist, the job is easy. We can co congratulate the client for taking really good care of their pet and then make a clear feeding management recommendation, what to feed, how much, and frequency per day. Even when there's nothing new to add to what the client is already doing, it's valuable to state the obvious by telling the client to continue feeding the product that they're using in the specified amount that they reported during the history taking and with the frequency per day that the client reported. And most importantly, we should record the information in our medical charts so it's clearly on file for the rest of the healthcare team in the future. This is also a great opportunity to reinforce the importance of monitoring that body condition score at home for the patient. When three or more risk factors are checked off on your nutritional screening checklist, it's an opportunity to engage the client in a conversation about a little deeper dive. 
either pursuing further diagnostics or asking a little more in-depth nutrition history. So for pets eating an unconventional diet or experiencing weight loss or weight gain, dental disease or GI signs, we might need to run some blood work, diagnostic imaging, and consult with the nutritionist to get a balanced homemade formulation. So what if a client doesn't want to pursue additional diagnostics? This is the situation that's your opportunity to talk about risk assessment. How much risk is the client willing to take if they wait and see? Whether or not a client pursues additional diagnostics can actually be framed in terms of what might be gained for the pet versus what might be lost. The upside of investing in diagnostics earlier rather than later is often that a subclinical or clinical problem can be identified and then better managed before it gets too severe or too advanced. That's right. The best prevention is early detection which might also mean treatment or the solution to the problem. It's potentially less costly in the long run. The downside of waiting is that the pet's medical issue advances in severity. And by the time the client wants to pursue treatment, the treatment can be more costly or the outcome much less favorable. So let's assume for a moment on that readiness to change scale, your client is somewhere between a five and a seven out of the 10, which means you have a good reason to believe that they're open to having that collaborative conversation with you. Where and how do you start? Well, we'd like to begin by acknowledging a mutual or shared goals that we have with the pet owner. It's really about partnering with our pet owners. We often state that we're in this together and we're in it together for the pet. We each want to make sure that the animal has the highest and longest quality of life possible. The next step requires curiosity on our part. We need to learn what the client's expectations are for their pet. And this is not just what and when they want to feed, but who else they're feeding in the home? What are the environmental factors? And what are the ter their expectations in terms of short-term, long-term health outcomes for their pet? They, how active do they want them to be? In order to understand what our client's expectations are, we should ask the client outright sometimes to describe the situation. For example, I will often start out my appointments by just simply asking them, what are your hopes and dreams for us to do together today? And what I like to start off by asking is just help me understand what your expectations are for your pet. You can see these are open-ended questions that allow the pet owner to tell us in their own words what they're experiencing and what they're expecting. And so they may not always come with that mindset. It often takes them aback, but gives them an opportunity to reflect what are they really hoping for as we partner together in their pet's care? A client might answer by focusing on the primary issue they've been dealing with at home. I just want to stop having to clean up her piles of throw up all over the house. Mm -hmm. If they stop there, you can follow up with, what other aspects of care for your pet would you like to improve? The client might answer by saying something like, well, since she can't clean herself, I have to bathe her more often than I want, and I'd like her to be able to clean herself more regularly. For those areas that the client doesn't focus on, you can get more specific. You can say, I haven't heard you say anything yet about her food. Can you tell me what your expectations are for what you want her to eat and how you want to feed her? This series of questions takes a little bit of time because we're trying to make sure we are as clear as possible in understanding what our client expects for their pet. And many people have not thought about these aspects in a way that is succinct. As in, I want my pet to do this, I want my pet to do that. We often need to elicit details by asking a few questions to understand if or where there are potential problems in terms of pet care or pet health or nutrition and diet in the home environment. We might even have to ask the client to go home and think about what they want, write it down and share it with us in, in a few days. A lot of members of my team are hesitant about this approach because they're worried it will take too much time. But when we align quickly with that client's expectations, in the end, I found it saves a lot of time. 
So now we're gonna talk about when, when no risk factors are identified. What does this mean? This means when the animal's physical examination is basically re remarkably normal and there are no issues from the medical or the dietary history that sound concerning to us. And under these circumstances, the patient has little to no risk regarding nutritional problems in terms of deficiencies or excesses. So when no obvious risks are identified, we have basically three simple steps to follow. We congratulate the pet owner on their care and attention of the animal's daily food and water needs, exercise and activity needs, their weight, their social care, attention, things like that. Then we state our specific nutrition recommendation for the animal, which helps reinforce what we want the client to do in terms of focusing their attention on at home. We're gonna specifically name the product that we want the owner to feed, specifically state the amount and the frequency, so how many times a day we want them to serve those meals. And then we're gonna list one or two things that we want the owner to monitor, and we're gonna tell them why we want them to do that. Our discharge instructions should be in writing, and in order to avoid confusion, we really need to align directly what we've said to the owner in the exam room with what we've written down and we're sending home for their go-homes. So what's the reason for separating the conversation between the exam room visit and after the client returns home with their pet? Well, the client doesn't always hear every recommendation or potential warning that we give them while they're inside our clinic. Mm -hmm. So sending them home with a handout or having the client watch a video after they get home can be a useful tool to extend the conversation. If they have questions, and I find they always have questions, um, then we can call or they can text the question to us and we can have a designated member of our team um, get some answers to them. Uh, someone from our team should be tasked with replying either in writing or texting or calling the client. And then what's the benefit of separating that conversation from clinic comments to an at-home Q&A? Well, we don't think it always, first of all, has to be the veterinarian who conveys the helpful or meaningful information. Um, if we've got other people on the team, then we're dividing the tasks and we're multiplying the successes of the team. And we also know that there are many clients who often bond with somebody on the team other than the veterinarian. So it could be an assistant, it could be one of our technicians, it could be even a, um, a customer care staff person at the front desk. We know that a large part of our success in these collaborative conversations is going to stem from empowering everybody on the team so that they can convey helpful and timely information between the doctors and the clients. Again, Every practice will have their own workflow, and we know that. So here is just an example of how to divide the tasks. Very often I hear from my colleagues, nutrition takes so much time. I posit it doesn't have to. When we're all dividing those tasks and supporting one another, we can really manage these patients quickly and efficiently and meet the client's needs as well as provide information the pet deserves to get great care. And we kind of challenge everyone who's watching this webinar to look at this list and try to identify where in your practice setting you might be able to uh, divvy up the tasks, to assign some of these tasks or activities to different members of your team, and, and also to think about which situations in your practice or your clinic um, might you have the greatest success. So now we're gonna talk about four areas where we think every day in practice you will be able to have a big impact in terms of nutrition conversations with your clients. Just before we look at our first example, there's one more tool we wanna to introduce and that's the circle of nutrition. This is a tool that's part of our, our assessment process and we use it to help frame nutrition recommendations. You can see by these two images that each section is connected to the next section by an arrow. For the animal section, we ask questions to evaluate what an animal needs from a nutritional standpoint. In the diet section, we're asking questions to determine if the current food is balanced or not, and we do the same with any other products the client is thinking about feeding. The last sections have to do with feeding management, both from an environmental standpoint and any human factors that must be accounted for. The arrows within the circle are there to remind us that we need to revisit all of these elements each time we see a patient. There are times when we may focus on the pet and other times when we may focus on the food 
or what the client is doing at home in terms of feeding management. We're going to use all of these aspects of the circle to build a complete recommendation, but we may prior to prioritize one element over another at any particular visit. And the bottom line is rather than thinking of this as a one-time assessment, this process is ongoing or iterative. And so it means that we will continue to do this each and every visit. And we're doing that in our follow-ups too to see if our recommendations had the outcome that we expect. And if not, we go around the circle again. Yeah. So here's an example in this slide of how we might um, frame our recommendations using the circle of nutrition for a dog named Bella. Given what I've assessed about Bella today, her nutritional requirements are that of a moderately active, healthy dog, which means her nutrient requirements are a lot lower than a growing puppy or a racing sled dog. Her body weight has been stable since we last weighed her, and her body condition score is a five on a scale from one to nine, which is perfect. The food you've been feeding her for the past nine months is product X and it's complete and balanced, which means it provides all the micronutrients and calories that she needs each day. She gets a small number of treats a few times a day or each week, and we've reviewed the calorie content of those treats so we know they're not excessive. You're giving Bella uh, three quarters of a cup of this product X in the morning and the evening, which works well for your schedule. And given all of these things, I'd say Bella is in excellent shape. You've done a fantastic job with her nutrition and daily activity. Let's continue with the same plan for the next six months and we'll reassess Bella when she returns for her next checkup. For your monitoring plan at home, let's review how to assign a body condition score so you can do that once a month. And you can email or text us what her score is. Usually when we say all of that, um, a lot of people think that takes a really long time. It only takes about a minute and a half. So it's, it's definitely doable in a busy practice. So we'll begin our examples with an easy situation. If we have a, a longtime client who trusts the team, he's a, he's a long-term client of ours, and he's willing to hear and follow our recommendations. Mr. Fedua gets a new kitten after losing his long beloved geriatric pet. He might not remember what we recommended for that cat as when he was a kitten. And so he wants to come to us to confirm that his food choice is what we would recommend. So we're going to reaffirm that choice. He's made an excellent product. He's listened to our advice in the past. And now we're going to focus on performing a body condition. My hope and dream is that every pet parent will learn how to confidently and competently perform a body condition score so that they can do that every month as part of their pet's care. It's easy because there's one animal in this family situation, one owner. The animal is healthy. We don't need to focus on a particular food need. And the client has a high degree of trust with the team. So he's ready to take our advice. It's one of the easiest ones. An example of how to frame that nutrition recommendation, again, our hope and dream is that every client leaves with a specific feeding recommendation. So when there's no risk factors, my conversation with Mr. Fedua may be something along the lines of, your new kitten Maple is adorable and we can see why you fell in love with her. Oh, who doesn't love a kitten? We're so glad you saw our advice to take uh, to talk about what you want to feed her. And we like your choice, brand, uh, product Y for some dry food and product Z for a little bit of wet food. Please offer her one quarter can of food each morning and evening, so as your meals, and divide the half a cup of dry food throughout additional meals throughout the day, or we can offer ideas as environmental enrichment or ways to use these for exercise and treats. We've reviewed with you how to do her body condition score. And while she's growing, we want you to do that every two weeks. We'll reweigh her and verify her body condition each time you come to visit us. And so when she comes back for her next booster. So for kittens, we wanna make sure that they're eating multiple times a day. That honors the catness of Cats like to eat small meals frequently, but not at the expense of overfeeding while she's growing. And so we want to really make a pitch for the importance of learning to do that body condition and monitoring it over time.
I'm going to use this exam too, this healthy kitten exam, to start planting seeds with Mr. Fedowa that needs are going to change over time. So when she gets spayed, when she reaches adulthood, when she reaches geriatric years, each time we're going to be addressing her needs and potentially be ready to change when her needs change. A moderately challenging situation would be one that I saw a few weeks ago where my patient was a large breed puppy named Red. The food choice was excellent. It was a very great product, uh, but on further inquiry, so again, I was asking a few more questions because they're training this puppy and we discovered, although the food was great, the owner was very focused on having a well-behaved large breed dog. So in, in, in inquiring, it totaled up to 60% of this pup's intakes were coming from treats. So no longer was the intake for this pup well balanced. He's a large, a large breed with growing pup needs. And so on the surface, if I had only asked, what food are you feeding? We could have easily missed this opportunity. So again, find out a little bit more about how and what, what and how they're feeding this pup. And then once we discovered that, ask the question, are they open to change? Key points for the veterinary team is, again, it's so tempting to just ask, what are you feeding? Verify it's an excellent product and a chance to move on to all the many other conversations. Especially if the dog is looking like it's in really good shape. Right, which was this the case puppy with had an excellent body condition great food, so he's doing well at the moment. But we are anticipating big problems could lie ahead when 60% of the intake is coming from treats. So I wanna focus this conversation on, uh, on positive messaging, highlight what's right, what they're doing well in training. But so again, affirm what's going well, but then also work with them to find a, a system that will work for them, but rebalance and meet the pup's needs. So a slight twist on this might be, I'm seeing that same large breed puppy where I discovered they were getting too many, too many of their calories from treat, but the owner can't fathom why they want to change or they're unwilling to give up that treat plan. How might we best approach this conversation? Well, the first thing is be curious, take a few moments to ask about their expectations their ability to consider adjusting either the treat regimen or anything else that you might be able to glean from their, their uh, conversation, their answers to you. So we're trying to listen to understand. We're trying to avoid um, making rash judgments about them or, or having biases. So we need to check our own biases and also try to listen and understand what are the client's potential biases. Um, we can still affirm the client's choice and discuss some risks. Mm -hmm. So if we feel like their choice of behavior or their choice of food is still gonna put their animal in some risk, then we can express that with them and we can give them some things to continue to monitor, body condition scoring, and then have them report that back to us in a few weeks, or maybe some slight adjustments to the food if they're willing to do that. And talking about rechecking, talking about um, monitoring, maybe even a, in a few days later, to have someone on the team call them and ask them, how are things going? Right. Again, they were a little hesitant if this, if this family is a little hesitant to change because really one of the priorities is a well-behaved dog. They might have a senior living in the house and a large dog could knock over um, the elder living in the house. So highlight that importance emphasize that I hear you. So the conversation may go something like this. Red looks great today, and we want to keep him at this healthy, lean state. I see how determined you are to have Red be well-trained as he reaches his adulthood. You might not realize this, but the amount of treats that you're using is way more than what's actually going in his food bowl. Could we talk about how the best way to rebalance his treats and his nutritional needs? Again, I'm gonna express this as worry and concern if we don't make a change and if they're not quite ready again, come back to that, let's monitor him very carefully. That's right. So here's an example of how another conversation might sound. 
uh, I might express it as, it sounds like you still have questions or hesitations about our recommendation. And Red is in good body condition now. So help me understand your thoughts. So we wanna invite their perspective. And then we might say, I know you're here because you want the best for Red, just like we do. May we offer a new idea for either some treats or um, some food? And, and they may say yes or no, but no matter what, we can also finish that conversation, at least for the time being, with an expression of, let's follow up in a month to see how he's growing. And in the meantime, please watch for X, Y, or Z. If you see any of these changes, we'll want to see him sooner. And plant some seeds. You may suggest some ideas. So in this case, one might be, as you have your training sessions, try those before his meal measure out his food, and then work with him from that food allotment because many of the training can be done with his, with his usual food. And then maybe the more difficult skills will need some higher value treats. Yeah. A potentially more challenging situation would be uh, this example where we're seeing a new pet owner who has just acquired a puppy named Willow. Uh, another large breed pup and from the breeder, the breeder is advocating feeding a raw food, a raw meat based diet. Our client may or may not be interested in this feeding option, but they want to get our opinion. This is the perfect opportunity to practice our communication skills and build rapport. Again, as Sarah has said, be curious. We don't need to launch into a long lecture, but take a few minutes and ask, what have you heard about raw meat diets? What are your expectations for this puppy? And then their ability to, to acquire the food or whatever food, where do you want to shop? How do you want to uh, purchase your food? And whether there are other people in the home that might be immunocompromised. So again, doing not just a risk assessment for the pet, but for that household. It can be a challenging conversation to have because our healthcare team may have strong feelings about this one particular topic, or it might be that the client has heard some things that are incorrect or even potentially dangerous for that pet. So we want to listen to understand. It just takes a little work to avoid or address their concerns, acknowledge what they've heard what they've heard, but also acknowledge our biases or our team's bias so we can approach the conversation without judgment. We want to affirm the client's choice of a puppy food and again, help steer them to a healthy choice. So we have another example of how we might start this conversation. Um, I would maybe say something like, from what you've shared, I understand that you aren't ready yet to change Willow's food today. Thankfully, she's in good body condition now. But when pups are young, things can change quickly. And I'd be worried that her bones may not grow properly and these changes might be permanent. I know you're here because you want the best for Willow, just like we do. So let's follow up in a month to see how she's growing. In the meantime, please watch for X, Y, or Z. If you see any of these changes, we'll want to see her sooner than one month. Oftentimes when I plant some seeds for what to watch for, that, that plants the seed of, oh, I'm worried about it. And they're much, I've found they're much more interested in changing at that next, at that next This visit. is also a really good place to offer up, if they're interested, additional resources. Mm -hmm. If you'd like to read about them, we've got a website for you. And so you can direct them to the resources that you are comfortable with and that you'd like them to, to be reading. Right. Our next category where we know that veterinary healthcare teams can make an impact in terms of nutrition conversations is myth busting. Our clients are searching for nutrition information and they also want an accepting environment in which to ask their questions. So we think veterinary healthcare teams should create that inviting environment to answer the questions. We want you to be a practice in which clients can come and ask questions. Many questions associated with nutritional myths have to do with ingredients. We know this. Some are simple, but others are more complex. Most nutritional myths have some small grain of truth in them, and those grains are often decades old and no longer factual or true. When or where possible, you should be acknowledging the grain of truth, where it came from, and then offer the more correct, more current information. It does take a little bit of effort to avoid some potential pitfalls, 
like sounding curt or dismissive of the client. We can be more successful when we acknowledge their interest and retain our curiosity about why the client is asking or what they have heard or read. For example, if the client asks, what do you think about product X, Y, or Z? We hope you won't respond with, we don't think much about it, uh, or I would never feed that food. Instead, try something like, I'm so glad you asked, what have you heard or read about these products so far? Or, we know these brands are relatively new, what questions do you have? The goal here is to engage the client, not shut them down or put them off. Listen for whether a client is ready to change in their thinking on a topic or a nutrition-related question. If they are, then you've got a potential teachable moment on your hands. If they're not ready to change their thinking, then this is a reason to follow up for more engagement later, rather than walk away and write the client off as a lost cause. It could be that their pet needs close-up monitoring and you really don't want to waste or lose that opportunity. Anytime your veterinary healthcare team attempts to bust a myth, you should have credible resources to offer your clients. Uh, Center Square has many resources you can use, and we recommend that you generate a list of websites or create your own handouts for the most commonly asked questions in your practice setting. You could even create a small little task force of technicians or assistants or customer care staffers in your team to write responses and then have the doctors review them. You could set up a contest and reward those who participate in getting the materials pulled together and distributed. And this is what we mean by being an askable practice, inviting those questions rather than shunning them because they take so much time, but having at the ready these great resources so that clients love to do research, so let's harness their powers at, for credible sources. If we don't, they will find information that's not so credible. That's right. In addition to Center Square, there's some great resources that Sarah and I use routinely, really on a daily basis. The World Small Animal Vet Nutrition Guidelines and website has many other tools, nutrition tools for our toolkit. For client-based uh, information, I like to send them to Pet Foodology, which is a blog through T Tufts University written at the level of uh, client reading. And for both clients and veterinarians, I also like to recommend the pet nutrition blog at um, the Ontario Veterinary College. Yeah, great resources. The next section where we think nutrition has the power to make a huge impact in pet health is managing healthy weight, both in preventing unhealthy weight gain as well as managing pets once they become overweight. The types of cases we see in the easy category are patients um, who are generally in good body condition, great body weight, and the owners are motivated to prevent problems. So in this example, uh, a new pet was adopted, but they formerly had a pet that was overweight. So they understand they've struggled in the past and they, they want to be there uh, to get advice from us, but they, they've got it covered, they're motivated. So what we might emphasize uh, is just to help them remember and, and understand the value of the body condition score, would teach that or reteach that to them. And we also wanna make sure that they understand for this pet and its current body weight, how many calories a day does it need? How many treats should it have? So making a, a strong, solid pet food recommendation for them. Yep. Don't walk away and assume because they had an overweight pet and they're motivated now to prevent that, that they have all the tools at hand. We need to be there and continually support and reinforce what a healthy body condition uh, score looks like. Maybe slightly more moderate in challenge where we, uh, where we assess there might be risks in the future are these types of cases where there's a, a little pup that was adopted from a shelter. Many of them have been neutered or spayed at a very early age or certainly by the time they leave the shelter. In the case of this one, she had multiple fractures. So again, unknown history, but when they've had a hard start, it sort of hurts your heart. And a, a pet parent's instinct is to feed with love. And so our emphasis for this client would be assessing for risks in the future. 
We know, again, at the time of spaying and neutering, we know energy needs are going to decline, and we need to preemptively help clients be prepared to monitor body condition score, and we will be there to make adjustments. Or in this case, if she had a scary surgery or she's got impending um, orthopedic problems, we want to make sure that they understand food is not the solution. That yes, they've had a hard start and we need to keep them on a healthy path by not overfeeding. So again, the veterinary healthcare teams that are nutrition ready for these collaborative conversations to engage clients, find out about their expectations or any potential concerns. They're worried their dog's gonna have surgery, they need to have lots of extra food um, after that surgery. We wanna avoid, uh, avoid those problems before they start. And, and actually the teams that are not nutrition ready, that mm -hmm. might be hesitant to talk about it or also think about it as well, the, the problem's not, it's not broken, so why try to fix it? Right. They, may, they may miss this opportunity. They may ignore talking about it. And, right. and we, would, we would hope that people would really pay and I attention to I it. I think the time of spaying and neutering is really primo for making a new recommendation and monitoring plan so that, we don't, so that we can avoid unhealthy weight gain. Key points that our team is gonna focus on for this little pup is having those the, a plan in place to teach them each time they come in to do a body condition score and a plan they'll do that once a month, that they will leave with a specific feeding plan so the pet parent knows how much to feed and how often. And if it's a youngster, having a specific treat plan so that they can incorporate their treating plan. Treating plan. And then I also set the scene for, uh, in our region, we have very distinct seasons. And so with the hard winters or a really hot summer, sometimes the pet's activity and energy needs will change. So I want to preemptively have that conversation so we avoid drastic weight fluxes during those seasonal changes. And so we want to make a plan for that. And now when we think about the slightly more challenging case, uh, we think about sometimes with prevention and weight management, um, some owners who may not be aware that there is a problem with their animal or a potential problem, um, or they, they just give us some sort of feedback that they are unwilling to change. So thinking about um, this, this kind of puppy uh, that we have here, a Labrador, who is post-neuter, um, we, we also think of the kind of owner who maybe was recently retired, and they are spending a lot of time with their puppy and just um, using food as, as a form of love. So we often see, we've seen this in the past couple of years also with a lot of people working at home. They're overfeeding, over loving their animals, uh, and, and that is potentially setting some animals up for a little bit too much weight gain. So we think first about assessment. Do we have some breeds that might be at risk? Uh, we think about the food and being able to examine the food content and the calorie content. Will the food potentially be one of those risk factors? And a family environment, thinking about are people at home for many hours of the day? Are they interacting with the animal in terms of with food but not really exercise? This could be a risk factor too. So we, we then come back to, again, as Julie said, if your team is nutrition ready for the conversation, they dive in, they ask a few questions, they try to find out from a curiosity standpoint, where is everybody in terms of their ideas about expectations for the animal and might they be willing and interested in a change to their behaviors, uh, maybe the number of treats or the types of food that they're feeding. So you can explore all of that with them. And, and some of the same points would be emphasized in terms of making sure they do understand how to do a body condition score at home and that they'll try to do it on a regular basis. Um, making sure that the owner does understand for the animal's weight today, here's how many calories it needs. And based upon the food that you're feeding, here's how many calories you're actually offering to the animal. So helping them see a mismatch mm -hmm. if, if that needs to be pointed out. That's one of the things. And then um, also, uh, paying attention to monitoring and regular follow-up. This is the reassessment in the circle of nutrition. And when we're at Askable Practice, if they notice a change in body condition, they'll come back to check with you. If, if you're a practice in which you can invite those questions right. and people feel comfortable doing right. it.
So in terms of these weight management preventions or maintaining a healthy weight, these conversations are about investing in the future. And so something that uh, a conversation I might have is to applaud the, the family. Odie's body condition score still is great right after his surgery. Let's review how to do a body condition score so you can do this at home and notice any changes right away. And remember, in, in our region, we have really uh, extreme seasons. And I know you like to take Odie hunting. So we can expect that he may have changes. He may actually need more food during those hunting months. And when he slows down, we may need to make an adjustment again when his activity is not so, so dramatic. And following up on that, the, the next thing that we want to make sure we convey is that that solid, clear recommendation, right? right? Uh, given the food that Odie's eating, we want to make sure that you understand he needs 500 calories a day. Your food has 400 calories in a cup. So let's make sure you continue to feed a certain amount in the morning, a certain amount in the evening. That will equal pretty close to what he needs, but we'll leave a little bit of space for some treats too. The 10 percent rule. Right. And of course, if you notice changes in body condition, you can always come back to anyone, any member of our team will be happy to help you make those adjustments. And again, a lot of people know that when you've practiced this, it doesn't take that much no. extra time. Now we're phasing into a weight management program where we need the pet to lose weight. So again, an example of an easy conversation might be when there's only one owner in the family, one pet. And one food. And one food. So fairly straightforward recommendation. Again, the process is similar to what we've discussed before, where we identify those risk factors. How, to what degree overweight is this patient? Identify it and align expectations with the client. Listen with empathy to understand and determine where they are on their readiness. Are they ready to hear your advice and or make a change? If yes, you proceed with your specific recommendation for a weight loss plan. If you're not sure, I just will straightforward ask, are you open to making a change? I have concerns and I, I think we can help him be on a healthier path or identify what risks are associated with unhealthy weight. And if they're not ready, I'm going to start, I'm not going to give up, but it's not the time to implement a plan or we'll all be frustrated. I'm gonna plant seeds of opportunity to improve pet health. I'm going to state things in terms of my concerns or worries if this weight gain goes unchecked. And in that worry or concern, I'm gonna to try to schedule a monitoring plan more sooner than the regular six months or a year when we'd see them back again. When they're ready to proceed, it's important to formulate the plan with them, right? So, so you're doing it in conjunction with them, uh, making sure that you understand, that they understand and that they've contributed to what they can do and how they're going to do it. We wanna anticipate barriers or pitfalls. Again, a very simple question to the client directly asking, what are you most concerned about? What do you think where your barriers or challenges will be? They'll identify it's their husband or their kids. So very often they know and you can focus your efforts where the anticipated challenges will right. be. And they often know also um, what one solution might be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because we are sending them back to the, to the environment that created weight gain. So those, those changes have to happen in their house. So if we don't partner with them, we won't be successful. Part of the plan is to also try to make smart goals, right? Right. So specific, measurable, something that you know could be achieved, uh, something that's relevant and time bound. Um, and, and so that, that is not really a goal that's set up to, um, to be something that's insurmountable or unattainable for the client. Um, so, right, we want your pet to lose 40 pounds before the next surgery. That's, that's unrealistic. And unhealthy. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's got to be um, condensed and easy for them and something they can buy into. So something they've contributed to. So our, fo our focus here is on some tools that might be especially helpful in developing a weight management plan. 
while we might be focused on how much the animal needs to lose, we should be equally focused on establishing and maintaining that good partnership, having them have input in making that plan. These situations require that we find ways to practice empathy. Our societies, both sort of real and virtual, possess a lot of fat bias. And so whether it's real or perceived judgment, we need to try to dispel that from the exam room and or it will just be a barrier to the relationship. I have yet to meet the overweight pet that wasn't loved. And when I hold that in my mind, judgment dissipates, right? That's a good way to think about it, yeah. And the other thing is that if, if helping um, pets lose weight was simple, no pets would be obese. Mm -hmm. so, um, so we need to keep that in mind too and make small goals that our clients can try to achieve. Right. I wanna give my clients, even in the beginning when we're developing our weight loss plan, sort of permission to fail. Weight loss is never slow and steady. We hit plateaus, weight loss, plateaus, we hit the skids. And when we address those up front that they might happen, then and their successes are our successes and their, their bumps setbacks. in the roads are our setbacks too, they're, then they're not reluctant to come back and th when they know their pet has gained weight. So again, we're in this together um, through mutual support. We want to celebrate small and large successes. So every visit is a success in some manner and we reevaluate those expectations every step along the way. We may not achieve that magic goal weight, but every little bit of loss is a step toward greater health and quality of life. Making that individualized plan is so key. Again, if this were easy and it's just a cookie cutter and that would, that would work out, it, this would be easy peasy, but it's really working together with the client in an individualized plan, not just for the patient, but for that environment. Again, the circle of nutrition is so key. We have to address all factors of that so that we'll have greater success. Because actually something that might work for a client for about the first three months mm -hmm. as they come back, uh, it, it may have not worked after that. And so we really need to adjust so that reassessment, reevaluation mm -hmm. is, is so critical. That's right. Still within the weight loss program, mm -hmm. we now want to talk briefly about the moderately challenging situations. Um, these often include more than one owner in the household, more than one pet, and as well, more than one food. So there's, there's lots of opportunities for, for challenges to arise. Uh, like before, we want to be listening with empathy to try to understand where are our clients coming from? What are their expectations? What have they tried before to help their pet lose weight? And are they ready now in this moment to follow a weight loss program that we might wanna engage with them for? And so again, if, if they're ready, we can mm -hmm. proceed. Um, if they're not so, if we're not sure and they're not sure, we, we need to ask. Um, and if they're not ready at all, then we, again, we don't give up on them, right. but we plant seeds to try to find a way to bring them back in a shorter period of time, maybe two weeks down the road, one month down the road, but to revisit the question, to revisit the situation with the animal and try to see if we can't jumpstart things from there. Right. right. I always reassure clients that I have many ideas. Many of them don't work in one family that will for them. So again, sometimes it just feels overwhelming. But when you know you have lots of solutions and they can pick and choose, it sort of empowers them and, and maybe moves them along the readiness scale. Right. So after the moderately challenging situations, there are some that are really difficult and they can be including anything and everything beyond just two owners in the household or two pets and, and multiple foods. And we want to acknowledge that primary care providers are really on the front lines where they are often the first one to identify these patients with unhealthy weight gain. And they often have to be that first voice to deliver the news. And yet sometimes I think we are our own barrier because we bring those assumptions, those biases into the exam room. Don't always assume because the owner might be overweight or the pet is overweight and there's multiple pets that it's always a challenging case. Sometimes it isn't. And again, if we employ that same framework, listening to understand, 
hearing what the owner's goals are, identifying risks. I think we very often use the same rubric in our conversations. Right. If they're not yet ready or the barriers seem too overwhelming, we just plant some seeds. I think we might also agree that sometimes the hardest cases are the ones in which um, the animal is not extremely overweight, mm -hmm. it's only modestly overweight, and the owner just doesn't see that as a problem. Right. Uh, we often have clients who will come and the animal is very overweight, and the owner is highly motivated yes. to try to make a difference. Yep. So when the risk factors have been identified, we know that they're there, um, and we want to try to identify whether or not the client is ready to change, we come back to the questions um, and sometimes clients will tell us directly, um, I, I can't do that, or I'm here, I want your help, how do I get started? So for, for nutrition ready practices, um, they've found ways and situations to introduce this topic. This is often very challenging for the clinic that isn't quite comfortable with nutrition conversations. Mm -hmm. um, so I think for, for me, I, I'm most comfortable just asking a client, help me understand where you're at today on the scale from one to 10. And I will often ask them, um, if, if one was you're not ready at all to change, but 10 is you're very ready, help me know where you're at. Sometimes giving an owner an opportunity to put a number on the scale can, can help you see, oh, okay, maybe they are more ready than I thought they were. Right. And so here are some examples of how we might get started. When we know that there are some risk factors, we've identified those for the client and we want to know, you know, are, are they ready to, to dive in? I sometimes, for these overweight pets, or we're trying to get a weight management plan started, I just speak my truth and I say that I am very confident that together we can help Luna be healthier, feel better, live longer. And I share success stories from other patients and how I've really watched a change in the pet's demeanor and quality of life. And I might say something like, you've been devoted to your pet for so long and I know you've tried a lot of tricks to get him to eat. Remind me of one of the things that worked best in the past. So if they can share that, we can, we can leverage that to, as a place to move forward just to get started. So now we're gonna shift gears away from weight management and talk about therapeutic nutrition. This is one of the other places where you can really have an impact with nutrition. Um, we think it's likely in the comfort zone for many veterinary healthcare teams because a number of manufacturers have created wonderful product guides that make offering recommendations pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. Veterinarians and veterinary technicians can simply play almost like a matching game by lining up a, a diet or product for a particular medical condition. However, even simple dietary recommendations or prescriptions should still include the four components of a complete recommendation. The product name, the specific amount that should make up the majority of the animal's daily nutrition, the frequency of meals, and a treat allotment. In reality, therapeutic diets and the sick patients who need them are really not so simple. And it's important to note this in the record as well as the discharge instructions. The names of some of the therapeutic products have become quite complicated. And with online purchasing, it's very important to identify that product specifically so the client will order the proper diet. Uh, so again, with a, an exact amount to feed because otherwise left to their own designs, they will just feed what the same amount they've fed their previous food. And so one, one idea that I've often done in practice is when clients are coming for the first time to meet with me, I'm asking them to take an actual digital photo on their phone of the foods that are at home in the pantry or in the cupboard, the treats that they have available to the animal, and bring those so that we can actually see what they are. There are, there are other challenges to successfully recommending a therapeutic diet. And so again, it's a myriad, uh, a list, which will be different for each unique practice and, uh, and patient. Some clients will, uh, re will disclose some concern about cost. That's very real, and yet sometimes they're actually paying more for some of the foods that they're already feeding. So just doing that quick comparison for them can help. 
Sometimes it's convenience of, do I have to go to a veterinary's office or where will I purchase this food? Sometimes there's a perception about uh, poor palatability. And again, these perceptions can often be overcome when we formulate a very slow and steady transition and specific transition plan for them. So again, uh, sometimes there's a feeling the owner's depriving them of food. Because one, one other sort of missed opportunity for prescription diets is relaying or conveying the information that this product is part of the treatment and that it works best when it makes up the majority of their intake. So often that at least isn't heard or perceived by the client and they're adding all sorts of things and potentially negating the therapeutic value of the diet. Yeah. And one, one last challenge that I can think of is also when the owners just simply don't have a perception that the therapeutic diet is really going to make a difference. Right? I'm, I'm not sure this will make a difference. Right. So again, sharing the evidence, uh, and many of them have evidence behind them. Yeah. The conversation for a therapeutic diet plan might go something like this. We know about dogs like Beanie who have lymphangiectasia and that they really need a low fat diet, that that has been shown to be really beneficial. This therapeutic diet is designed with low fat, but it's also balanced with all the other nutrients that Beanie will need. Whereas an over the counter product won't be low enough in fat. And so given that you have another dog or a cat in your home, let's talk about how we'll feed Beanie to keep her from eating those other pets' foods. Because again, that could potentially negate the benefit of the, of the therapeutic diet. And then given everything we've discussed today, I want to give them one or two things that they um, might be able to do at home over the next couple of days. And I'm going to certainly have either myself or a member of our team follow up. So follow up and follow through in just a few days to see how's it going. Can I troubleshoot early before they decide it's not a workable plan? And a couple of our guidelines for creating these recommendations would be to, to identify if, if and when necessary up front, uh, should we remove the current food that's aggravating the pet's medical condition, be it a skin condition or GI condition. Um, in some situations, we may need to substitute treats for food and set a trial period, a short trial period, and then recheck the patient's progress. Mm -hmm. um, we want to set up short or, or midterm, possibly even down the road, some long-term goals. But I'm, I'm a fan of short-term goals that the, uh, the owner can manage and that we don't let the owner go too long before we get to see the pet right. and talk to the owner again. Um, we, we should always be prepared for questions in the exam room and also a couple of days later. And, and where you've got nutrition-ready practices, then someone on the team can be assigned to be that person who does the follow-up. Mm -hmm. We know you've got some questions or we gave you a lot of things to think about. How can we answer some questions for you? Uh, in my experience, people always have a question or two a day or two later. Right. So we want to stay connected, work on small goals, and troubleshoot before our problems really become big and then celebrate successes. Yeah. Adherence is often reported to be the weak link of healthcare. And so we've uh, listed some ideas that we have to promote adherence. We wanna believe in the value. When the team buys into the positive impact that nutrition can play in the health, both in wellness, prevention, and treatment, then authenticity just shines through in our language, in our body language, and in our troubleshooting ideas. Work to stay positive. Some clients may feel badly if things didn't go as planned or they didn't understand what your recommendations were. And so we can normalize that by sharing statements such as this is a common perception or a common problem. Many clients have, have understood it that way. And so again, normalizing that and clarifying in a positive and supportive way. Mm -hmm. We use impactful stories all the time. So again, shaping that message so it's personal. If clients ask me what I would do, I share that information. Or oftentimes I've done that with, uh, with my big uh, pack of animals at home. So again, the power of the parable of the story is just really so important and more likely to stick. Uh, really, it's all about partnering with clients. 
ask what they're able and willing to do. Are, do they understand the power that these changes might bring in the health of their pet? Because our goal is to figure that out and partner and care with them. All right, so our key takeaways are the big three. We, we recommend and hope that you'll use a framework for building your nutrition conversation. Under that is the assessment of the patient, a clear recommendation, some follow-up to evaluate or reevaluate, and then recording the outcomes. The second key takeaway is investing in communication training to address nutrition-related questions. And the final is the payoff. What are you going to get? Enhanced client engagement, more loyalty with your practice, but more than anything, clients adhering to recommendations so that they can have the best outcomes for their patients. We firmly believe these conversations have the power to positively impact pet health and strengthen the bonds between our team and our clients. If you want more information, if you're craving for knowledge, check out Center Square. They have an, an area with additional tools on nutrition education, as well as a section on these crucial conversations with clients. We hope you'll give it a try. Thank you, everyone. It was so nice to uh, have your engagement. And we are now here live. Sarah and I are so happy to receive any questions you might have. And actually, you guys have done a wonderful job, you in uh, attending with us right now, uh, in, in putting questions to us. So we've, we've got a variety of them, and we are going to answer them for you. Um, if you're still listening, we're going to take a few minutes to answer questions, and you can continue to put questions into the um, into the chat or the box, and we will have things come up in the queue for us. Yes. Sarah, okay. Sarah, I see that we've received a number of questions regarding implementing nutrition in the clinic setting. And so one question, uh, a few of them, but one uh, was in our clinic, not everyone is at the same level of interest in having nutrition conversations. And how do we change that? Oh, I love this question. Uh, first, I, I just want to make sure that everyone appreciates that, that not everyone on the whole team has to you know, sing out of the same songbook. Not everybody has to be um, a nutrition advocate. It would be lovely if everyone was, but but we know in reality that that's not going to happen. So so what you need to work toward is not everyone, but a critical mass, right? Some of the doctors, some of the technicians, some of the assistants, hopefully some of the customer care team at the reception desk, hopefully one of the practice managers or the practice manager at least even if they don't want to have ongoing nutrition conversations, if they can at least support the people that do, that's that's really the ultimate goal that you're working toward. So, so how does one even get started? I, I think it's first you spend a little bit of time talking about and thinking about what are your expectations to have a nutrition ready clinic? What does that mean for you? If you if you wrote down from earlier in the webinar that on the scale from one to 10, that you were at a five or below, you, you kind of have nowhere to go but up. So you can say, all right, well, what are the things that we do right now that, that make us look nutrition ready? And, and what might be some other things that we could do? Uh, and, and you have to start really with where you're at. With, with your role, what you like to do, the kinds of conversations you like to talk about, and, and the ways you like to help clients with their pets nutritionally, and, and you move from that place. So, so I think you start with thinking about what does it mean for you to enjoy or to work on nutrition conversations, and, and how can you expand outward from that? So I'm going to start with that, Julie. Do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I, I agree, Sarah. Critical mass, just not everyone will have the same surgical expertise in the practice, so not everyone will have the same acumen in nutrition. But getting a, a, a team together, they can become, they can get that expertise and build on it and then be the go-to center in the practice. And it, it just builds because once 
once they're having success, more of our colleagues then will often um, join the bandwagon. I've, I've seen that happen over and over yeah. again. So another thing to think about is for practice managers and for veterinarians is that they can support the staff, the team members, the technicians and assistants who do want to talk by, by supporting through training, by supporting through bringing resources, and then also just encouragement. Um, I, I think another thing to think about is your, your weekly or your monthly or your quarterly kind of team meeting. It, hopefully, people are having regular team meetings, but, but you might be the person who brings to the agenda uh, either every meeting or every other meeting. Hey, I've got a nutrition topic I want to talk about. Um, maybe it's just, can we do more body condition scoring? Can we get it in the record? Can we communicate to with each other on the team through the medical record about consistently putting body condition scores for all of our patients? And, and maybe it's something else, but that's that's just one little idea. Hey, here's a great follow-up. And how can we help enable the staff to engage the client who tends to only want to speak to the vet? Oh, yeah. Well, I, I think that there can be ways to think about nutrition and incorporate nutrition in regular conversations by looking at some of the other aspects of the practice. And, and Julie, you just said, right, now everybody's going to be um, an excellent surgeon in the practice. So people are going to find their, their niche, their area where they, they do have a high comfort level and a good skill level, and that's going to be what they're known for. And, and in some respects, this is also true in, in the realm of nutrition. And in, in the way I'm thinking about it is this, right? Not, not everybody is going to perform dentistry on the animals, but with a little bit of training and education, anyone on the team can actually talk to the pet owner about the procedure that was done on the teeth, uh, cleaning the oral cavity, taking care of the animal's oral cavity after the procedure, or getting them ready beforehand. And this is the same idea in nutrition. The veterinarian can make the recommendation and get it in the record, but in fact, to follow up, to answer questions, it really can be any, anyone else on the team member who's either had some training and some support. And so, so I think part of the way that we help our pet owners, our clients understand that it's really gonna be other people on the team who are engaged in conversation with them is we get support from the veterinarians and maybe even the practice managers to actually convey to the owners. I, I can't be the person who's always on the phone with you all the time. I'm gonna be really busy but I've got a wonderful colleague or a wonderful support person who's gonna follow up with you. And when they, you know, when they ask if you have any questions, please give them your questions, right? So you, the, the person that they'd like to talk to the most needs to give the, the pet owner both the permission to engage with the technician or the assistant, but also, specifically say, I support this person. They know what they're doing. They will bring any questions that they can't answer for you. They'll bring it to me and I will, you know, they'll be my conduit. They will convey to you the information I want you to have. That, that's got to start at, at some level from the veterinarian. I, I agree, but I want to just say loud and clear that it is our technical staff that are the superstars of nutrition. So really it it is a team sport. And so I think it's worth investing in finding those technicians that really love nutrition because there's a lot of them out there. They're frequently the first line. And so finding out where their interest lies, provide them with Nutritional Education Center Square has a lot of resources for staff training. And then I empower them and also ensure the client that we work as a team and so talking to that nurse is really really you know it's invaluable and they do take more time typically because they have it and it just makes a, a dynamic um, relationship with those clients one thing i will add also is that in some practices someone might feel like really they're, they're the lone wolf, that they don't really have as much support as they would like. And um, if, you, if 
If our listeners didn't know about the American Academy of Veterinary Nutrition, this is an organization that, although American is in the title, it's really got a membership that's international. And it is open to veterinarians, technicians, um, veterinary students, uh, a, a wide host of people who would be interested in nutrition. So you can go to the aavn.org website and you can look and see how you might think about becoming a member because they have a listserv, they have a newsletter. It's, it's a community of people in the practice of veterinary nutrition, or sorry, veterinary medicine who are interested in nutrition. And if you had questions that you wanted to ask, if you had people that you wanted to network, how do you do this? How do I get this done? Uh, this would be a really good resource for some of you. Okay, so we're going to shift gears a little bit. Julie, it's my turn to ask you some of these questions. We've got several from folks that wanted to know, um, have, have you weigh in on um, the whole conversation around overweight animals and, and with the owners who may not recognize the animals overweight. And, and there's, there's a part two to that also, but um, just so somebody expressed, um, even after showing the body condition score chart, yes, um, the yes. owner still not convinced. What what kinds of tips do you have for that situation? Yeah, I love these. I love these clients. In fact, I had one on Tuesday where the where they didn't recognize that their pet was overweight and in fact denied it. So I just opened the conversation by asking if anyone had had uh, spoken about them about a body condition score. If you've already done that. I would invite, let's review that score. So I don't use, in fact, the client responded to me, my dog's not fat. And I don't use that F word. So I try not to use that language, but I say, well, let's score this pet together. There's something about showing, but there's a lot more power in doing. And so again, I use my hand as the model. And if you feel the back of your hand, that's what the pet's rib cage should feel like. So I go through that and really just talk about it objectively. We do endorse the nine point scale and I am a big proponent of making that the universal standard so that we're all using the same language and those numbers are consistently understood. And so when we score the pet together, and again, this is where imp use the team. Each and every visit, I, you or a team member can review that body condition score because our social norm is an overweight pet. We don't know what healthy looks like or feels like anymore. So we have to be the antidote to tell them this is what healthy looks like a five out of nine. And so when the owner doesn't recognize it yet, we score the pet I translate that into what percentage overweight that would be, 10% for each score. And then I express that in terms of risks, health risks. I, and so how we can help their pet be healthier, avoiding the judgmental language, just talking in terms of number and health. It, it goes a long way. Okay, so here's the follow-up question. And it, it does, refer to a reference judgment. Um, how do you have conversations about weight loss with owners who get defensive? Maybe you haven't used um, judgmental language, but they are projecting to you that they feel like you're judging them in some way. Where, where do you go with that? Yeah, again, with empathy. I understand I've not always been the weight that my are my hopes and dreams. And so I understand that it can be a battle both for, um, again, I don't introduce the topic of an overweight person, but often they will uh, give me that invitation that yes, it can be a battle. Talking in terms of health, objective language and concern for that individual and that won't matter or my conversation won't change if the owner is slender or if the owner is is thicker it, because it's really i'm here to help their pet get healthier so i leave my bias at the door okay here's a question um how do you respond when an owner comes in with a lot of their own research so maybe we can we can do this one together. That sounds good. Uh, 
That's your I friend. know I don't I don't want to see the long list of research. I know that. I don't have time for that. I don't think anybody else does either. But I I do want to be curious and I want to allow the owner to talk about at least, you know, with one open-ended question to tell me something about why they wanted to do the research. That's, that's what I really want to get at. What's, what's the why behind the, you know, the question behind the question, because if I can understand that, that's going to help me get a glimpse at what are their expectations. Usually when people are doing this research on their own, it's because they either don't have faith or belief or trust in, in sources of information. So they're looking, looking and searching. And, and I think in, in some respects, it's an opportunity for us in the, in the healthcare team to say, if, if there is a lack of trust, how can we rebuild that? Or if it's a brand new client, how can we start to build some trust with this client? So I, I don't want to come at them with, well, I'm not sure I really believe your research. I've got this other research for you. It's, it's not, I don't think that's very productive. I think it's trying to listen to what they're presenting and, and get at the heart of what are their expectations. And obviously, if we don't have a lot of time in a particular visit, then, then we're really trying to narrow it down and do some triage and say, what are your expectations for your pet for today's visit? And if they've got a very long list of expectations, like more than two things, then, then we have to frame the boundary for them. Wow, it's, it's great that you are so interested in Fluffy's health that you have these things you want to talk about. For our time today, we can probably address the top two concerns that you have. And for the other things, we're going to need to make an appointment, you know, an, another appointment or a recheck or, or an opportunity for the client to speak with the technician or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. What do you I, want to add, Julie? Yeah. So again, I used to just shudder at the idea of these folks coming in with research because let's be honest, a lot of times they're finding information we not we don't deem as credible. So you want to capture what's right. I say shine the light on what's right. And so I applaud their interest and their passion about nutrition and the power it has on their pet's health. And then like you, a zero in question, what are you, mo what are, you know, what is your goal? What are you most hoping for that hopes and dreams so that we can then start to unpack? Well, uh, that's a very common belief. And yet we now know there it, it's perhaps not true. So again, zeroing that in, you've embedded, uh, you've answered a couple of these other questions too about the question of time. I too will, if we run out of time, uh, you have so many great questions. I really think we need to, we need to schedule another appointment so we can devote full attention to your questions. And, and I would suggest charging for that. Again, some questions about should we charge for nutrition services? Absolutely, people. You yes, should charge for nutrition consultations. And your knowledge. Yes, indeed. Yes. All right. So, Sarah, it looks like we are, um, we have used our 15 minutes, but there's some really great, great questions. One is where can you find the communication training that you mentioned? The communication training? Well, yeah. hang yeah. on a second. Besides the communication training, I'm seeing these other questions. Okay. And people want to know, will this webinar be available for their staff to view on demand? And other people want to know about body condition score charts and all these other resources, right? So this is our opportunity to talk about go to the Center Square website because it's all there, right? I want to just show you to check this out. This is a screenshot of the website that you used to enter the uh, Nutrition Conversation webinar tonight. Several people were so excited they want to share this with other members of your team. You'll go back to that website and in the upper right hand corner where it says log in, you'll log back in and you can have access to viewing this on demand share it. We'd love to share the wealth because yes. it makes us so excited. All right, let's go to the next slide. 
if you would like to get your certificate to download, yes. the certificates yes. will be available in five minutes after this session has ended. But you have to go to your profile mm -hmm. and you click on your profile and you'll see something that says certificate download. Correct. And then don't miss these other resources. Check them out on that banner again in the middle you can find out more. There are loads of resources on those conversations and how to have them, as well as resources of other nutrition content. So you can match your confidence and your competence together. So for example, there's a video um, where we're talking about how to talk to a pet owner about a raw diet. There's also a written piece that the team at Purina Institute has written about, you know, something you could print off and give to your pet owner. Here's some things to think about regarding raw diets so that you, because you aren't going to have a lot of time, but you could refer your clients and your team members to these resources, be they printed or video. They don't take a lot of time to watch or to read, but they can help provide you and your team with some confidence, some knowledge, and also some, some tips on just how to keep the conversation going with your pet owner. Right, and you can use many of those resources for your staff training for those, to get your core team up and running. And if you're hungry for more, you can also check out the swag bag that has some other nutritional nuggets. These resources are also where the body condition scoring, the muscle condition scoring, where those kinds of uh, tools will also be available. Okay, everyone, we You're wanna delighted. thank you again. Yes, thank you. It's been such a lovely evening. Nothing is more fun than talking about nutrition and conversations with our clients. We hope that you've been a little bit um, motivated and that maybe you'll uh, take some information back to your team tomorrow or the next day and, and try to engage with your clients with some nutrition conversations. Thank you. Have a great night.